Now, this might be surprising for some of you, but uh, sort of, I, I, I'm kind of a little bit of a nerd in the area of theology. I just kind of enjoy reading theology and learning about different perspectives on theology. And uh, there's this interesting phenomenon that I've observed with regard to theology. And that is this, that we tend to shape our theology and everybody does have a theology, even atheists actually have a theology, even though they don't believe in God, that's part of their theology. And theology is simply the study of things that are beyond ourselves um, as far as, you know, spiritual realities. And what, what we tend to do in our theologies is we tend to take attributes from ourselves especially the ones that we kind of admire and we tend to project those onto God. So in a sense, this sounds bad, but whether we realize it or not, we tend to create in our own minds, a God that is in our own image. Now we try not to do that by, you know, studying the Bible and, you know, trying to see who God really is. But we have these hidden biases within us that we aren't even aware of. And we tend to, to kind of put those onto God and read those into the Bible. And so we create these imaginary attributes of God and you know, if we, if we lean in a certain direction, we tend to project God as that kind of personality. Or if we lean in another tra- direction, we tend to project God as that kind of personality. And that's one of the reasons, actually, why people get turned off of religion and turned off of church. Because they can see through that sometimes. They go, oh yeah, you're that kind of person, so you'll probably worship that kind of God. And to be honest with you, I don't really blame people for being turned off by that. But today, I want to talk about an aspect of Jesus that for some people is very exciting and you know, kind of gets their adrenaline going, like, yes, this I love. But for other people, this aspect of Jesus is kind of scary. And they kind of go, I don't know if I want to really study that or know too much about that. So whichever way in which you lean, I invite you today to just kind of Go take a deep breath right now and kind of go, okay, we're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. So I want to start this morning in a little part of the Bible close to the end called Thessalonians. And there's two little letters called Thessalonians. There's 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And one of the things that I love about the Bible, in spite of the fact that we as humans bring our biases to the reading of it, the Bible actually is very honest. It addresses things really kind of head on, just straight up. It doesn't beat around the bush. Now, some people feel like it may be does because it sometimes is trying to explain some very complex things and it can feel overwhelming. But the truth is God doesn't dance around the truth. He is pretty straight up. And if we have the courage to read the Bible in a very kind of honest, straight up kind of way, God can use the Bible to speak to us in very powerful ways. 
So today I want to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and starting in verse 13. And we're going to read right through to the end of the chapter and then the first four verses of chapter 5. Now, normally we often don't kind of read across chapteral divides like that uh, because it just those divisions in there were sort of make sense thematically. But in this case, it doesn't make sense to break there. Uh, You realize that the chapter breaks and the verse breaks in the Bible were not put there by God. That was humans that did that just to make it easier to study. So, you know, we don't, it's not, there's nothing sacred about, you know, breaking up the Bible a little bit differently than the way that, those chapters and verses were broken up. So starting in verse 13, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns... God will bring back with him the believers who have died. So just let me stop there and say, so this was written after Jesus had been here on earth and gone back to heaven. So when he says that Jesus returns, he's talking about another time that Jesus is going to come over and above the time that he's already been here. Okay. So then he says, we tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from the graves or from their graves, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Now coming now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, And you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. Okay, there's lots of stuff in there that we could unpack. So let me just first start with sort of the obvious question. What on earth has this got to do with Christmas? I mean, it's Christmas in five days or six days or whatever it is. Like, aren't we supposed to be talking about Christmas? I mean, this is normally a passage that we would read at a funeral. Like, why on earth are we talking about this around Christmas time? So let me just explain it this way. We tend at Christmas time to celebrate the wonderful sweet things. You know, the little baby, the sheep, the shepherds, the angels singing, you know, the nice music and all of those wonderful things. And that's a wonderful part of the Christmas thing that we all love and cherish and so on, which is good. And, you know, we celebrate the wise men and the gifts and all of that. And... And that tends to sort of take the foreground. But there are some other aspects to the Christmas story that we're less familiar with. And that we maybe aren't actually as pleasant. Well, the fact is they really aren't as pleasant, but they still are part of the Christmas story. Um, 
like the Jewish Messiah, which is what Jesus was for the Jews, he had been predicted for hundreds of years, many different times, like Pastor Emma told us last Sunday. And Jewish scholars had been studying these prophecies for hundreds of years. And they, they uh, actually were pretty convinced that they knew exactly how this was all going to play out. Those, the details in all of those prophecies that they had been studying. And you got to realize that the Jewish scholars, I mean, they gave their life to the study of these prophecies. They would literally spend their career studying these things. And so they were really convinced that they knew exactly what this was going to look like. Now, if you read the Christmas story, you'll notice that when the wise men came, and this is in Matthew chapter uh, 1 and 2, you'll, you'll notice that the wise men first came to Jerusalem asking where this king of the Jews was going to be born. Well, they knew where the king of the Jews was going to be born, the Messiah. They knew it was Bethlehem. But it's interesting because when they came, if you read it, you can read it in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3. It says that when they asked uh, Herod where this king of the Jews is going to be born, that the whole city was in an uproar. Imagine that. Somebody comes to White Court and asks, where's the king being born? And they are so into this coming king, Messiah, that when one person from abroad asks the question, the whole city is in an uproar about it. It's hard to even wrap your head around that. But that's how, how deeply entrenched the Jews were in the anticipation of this Messiah coming. And the reason it created an uproar was because it wasn't playing out the way they had anticipated that it would. Somewhere they had missed something and, and now they were wrestling with what's going on here. Like, why are you asking that question? Like, this isn't the way it's supposed to be the way we thought it was supposed to be. And so one of the terrifying parts of the Christmas story is that Herod, after these wise men had been there, they went from there to Bethlehem and they found Jesus, they worshiped him and so on. And then they left. But, you know, we often picture the wise men there with the shepherds and the sheep and all of that. But the truth is they actually came quite a bit later than the shepherds did. So, you know, the, the manger scene with both the shepherds and the wise men is actually not accurate. And if you read it carefully, you, you realize that Jesus was actually living in a house, not in a stable when the, the uh, wise men came. And one of the things that Herod asked the wise men was how long they had seen the star that they were following. And the reason he asked that was because he was intimidated by this idea of somebody else becoming the king. Because Herod was the king of the Jews. And so he thought, this guy is going to usurp my throne. So what he did is he actually sent his soldiers to Bethlehem after Jesus had, uh, or Mary and Joseph had fled from Jerusalem, or Bethlehem to Egypt. And he had his soldiers wipe out every male child, two years old and younger in the whole town. That's not a pretty part of the Christmas story. But that's the, the truth because they were so uptight about what was going on here and how this was playing out. Now we learned last week that we actually saw that there were three prophecies in particular that Pastor Emma showed us that Jesus fulfilled. That's three 
out of actually over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled from the Old uh, Testament. Now, I said I'm a bit of a nerd. Think about that statistically. What would be the statistical odds that one person could fulfill all of those 300 plus prophecies? Now, I'll be honest with you, I, I enjoy math, but that kind of math is beyond my, my pay grade. So actually, they went to uh, Professor Peter Stoner. So he's the chair of the Department of Mathematics at the Pasadena City College in California. And I don't know if he has the capacity even to figure out what the statistical odds are for 300. So he came back with this number. He said, the, the statistical possibility for one person to be able to fulfill 48 out of those 300 plus prophecies is one in 10 to the 157th power. So for those of you that, uh, you know, enjoy math, that means the chances are one in 10 with 157 zeros behind it. So if I were, had a whiteboard up here and I, I wrote 10 and then put 157 zeros behind, the chances of one person being able to fulfill even just 48 of those 300 plus prophecies would be that number. Just let that sink in for a minute. That's just incredible. Or maybe more accurately, that is profoundly credible. So Jesus has already done some things that just blow our mind the first time he came. But then we've got all these prophecies like the one we just read saying that Jesus is actually going to return a second time. So the thing about this pro prophecy that really stands out to me is that he says, on the one hand, that we should be comforted by these words, or we should comfort one another with these words. But then on the other hand, he says, there's going to be unexpected disaster. How on earth does that fit together? Like, how can you comfort somebody by saying, we're going to have a sudden disaster, like a thief in the night? So many people who have studied the prophecies of the Bible have made bold predictions about how all of this is going to play out. When Jesus will come back, how he will come back, what it'll look like, what the situation will look like in the world when that happens. Some of you may have even talked to some of these people. They often come door to door. Jehovah's Witnesses often talk about the end times and what that will look like. Or Mormons often talk about that when they come door to door. And maybe you've seen people on television or, you know, on the internet talking about uh, Jesus coming back and what that all will look, look like. There have been lots and lots of books and articles written about this with all kinds of different predictions about what it will look like when these prophecies will be fulfilled. I'm going to be honest with you. The truth is many, many of those predictions have come and gone and proven to be false. 
There's been lots of them that, you know, were very spectacular in nature and looked like they were, you know, very believable. And then the date came or the circumstances changed. And now they've been completely discredited. And the problem with making predictions like that is, like Jesus said here, that nobody really knows exactly when that's going to happen. As a matter of fact, Jesus said himself that he didn't even know when this was going to happen. You can read about that in Matthew 24, verse 36. He says, only the Father knows when this is going to happen, not Jesus himself even. And so whenever people make predictions about these kinds of things, we need to be very, very cautious. One of the things I often think about is you think about all those Jewish scholars who were convinced they knew exactly what it was going to be like when the Messiah would come. And those were the ones that missed Jesus by a country mile when he actually did come. Their predictions were so different than the way it actually played out that they they couldn't connect the dots at all. And sometimes I wonder if it's going to be the same way the next time Jesus comes. That all of these scholars and people that have studied up on these prophecies are actually going to completely miss what happens. Because they've got these ideas about what that might look like. I grew up in church and maybe some of you did as well. And I remember as a young person having preachers come to our church who had it all figured out exactly what it was going to look like when Jesus would come back again. And this would happen and then that would happen and then this other thing would happen and so on and so forth. I remember one of the ones that stands out to me is I remember one preacher saying that uh, there was something about uh, um, a certain type of predatory bird. I can't remember what it was now, but it it was a, a bird that was, you know, would eat carcasses. And these birds normally lay only one egg and only have one chick per, per season kind of thing. Well, he came to tell us that the end times were on us because now these vultures, yeah, that's what it was. The vultures in the Middle East are laying four and five eggs every year. So that was a clear sign that Jesus was coming. What? It turned out that that wasn't the case at all. They're still just laying one egg. But we were so gullible, we just bought into that. And we thought for sure, oh man, yeah. And, and, you know, I think some people find this sense of being able to predict the future gives a sense of comfort. Because then we feel like we have some sense of control. And, you know, if if you could tell what's going to happen next, it would make you feel less intimidated by it. Um, I'm not sure that that's why Jesus has these prophecies in the Bible. Because the truth is that if that was what he wanted for us, I think he would have made it a little clearer, a little easier to understand. Now, some people are really excited by the idea of Jesus coming and putting on this grand display of power and punishing all the bad guys and, you know, being this great superpower kind of person. And then we, as his followers, get to be on Jesus' team. So we get to be on the good guy team. And all these bad guys that we are feeling mad at, they will get their due. That's exactly how the Jews actually felt about 
the Messiah before Jesus came. They were convinced that the Messiah would come and punish all the Jewish enemies, set them free from their oppressors. And at that time, it was the Roman Empire that had taken over the Jewish region. And so they were convinced that the Messiah, when he came, he was going to show his power by throwing out the Romans. Well, Jesus did show his power in very miraculous ways, but it wasn't at all the way that the Jews thought he would. And sometimes here again, I wonder when Jesus comes the second time and shows his power, if it'll look a lot different than those that are really thinking that Jesus is somehow going to really make a big splash. So I hesitate to speculate about that. But the interesting thing about this passage that we just read is that it says that it won't catch us by surprise. How does that happen? Like if we, if we don't know when it's coming, how can we not be caught by surprise? And I think that the way that happens is by being ready all the time. Now, not in a fear-driven way where it's like, oh, is he coming? Is he coming? And that's what actually it used to be like when I was a, a kid. When preachers came to talk about Jesus coming back, Often the, the underwriting message was, you better walk the straight and narrow because you never know when Jesus is going to show up and you don't want to be caught doing something bad that you shouldn't be doing. And I remember having those cold sweats going, what if Jesus showed up right now and I'm stealing a cookie out of the cookie jar? The truth is, fear is a great way, a very powerful way, actually, to control people's behaviors. Behavior modification through fear is effective. Probably all of us were scared in one time or another of the consequences of being caught. And that fear caused us to not do certain things that we otherwise would have done. But the truth is, God is not after behavior modification. He's after changing our heart. He wants to change us from the inside out so that our behavior is just a reflection of our desires, not of our fears. And fear is very bad at changing your heart. I don't know what kind of kid you were, but there are kids that have this idea when their parents or their principal or their teacher or their coach or whatever tells them to do something. Well, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Any of you recognize that attitude? Maybe not in yourself, but in somebody else, you know, just asking for a friend. That's because fear is not a very good way to change our hearts. But love is a very powerful way to change our hearts. How many of you have ever seen a, a guy who's really macho and then his wife is pregnant and, you know, he's never been interested in babies or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, when his own child is born... His brain falls out. <laughs> all of a sudden, he's making all these weird noises and faces, and, and he can't be together with this baby enough. What has changed him? Is he scared that his wife is going to beat him up? 
No, it's not fear. It's love that has changed him from the inside out. Because love is a very powerful way to change our hearts. Sometimes we've heard preachers, when, like when I was young, going, are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to meet your maker? And it's this fear idea. And really all it does is make us all sweat. But it doesn't change us. It's the internal transformation that Jesus love brings. That's what he's really after. And I believe that if we are deeply in love with Jesus, we will be ready when he comes. It won't catch us by surprise. How do we stay in love with Jesus? How do we stay in love with anybody all the time? For those of you that have been married for many years, how do you stay in love with the person you're married to? Well, it's actually not that complicated. You stay in touch. You stay close to each other. You keep talking to each other. You keep doing nice things with each other and for each other. And it's exactly the same thing with Jesus. And that's what we call prayer. That's what we call listening to Jesus. That's what we call reading about Jesus. That's what we call learning about Jesus. All of those things help to feed our relationship with him. Staying tuned into Jesus daily is really what keeps those fires burning in our heart, in our relationship with him. And then another thing that we can do to keep those love, fire burn, love fires burning for Jesus is hang out with other people who are in love with Jesus. That's why we have church. That's why we have small groups every week. Because when we t- are together with other people, the fire burns hotter in our own hearts. And as we do life together on this journey of loving Jesus, we grow in our love for him and we are more and more prepared for when he comes back. Let me just check my phone here and see if we've got any questions coming in. No, not now. So if you have questions, feel free to still text them to me and I'll respond later. So I know this was a long time ago, but when Shelly and I got engaged, it was pretty amazing. Um, so we, we had been dating for a number of months and we would talked about getting engaged. We'd been to look at rings and I had a pretty good idea of what she wanted. So I went back to the store and got the ring that I thought she wanted the most. So, I mean, she knew that this was coming, but she didn't know exactly when we were going to get engaged. So it was her birthday, the 10th of July, and I had made her a birthday present. And um, some of you know I love to do woodworking, and I have the scars to prove it. <laughs> and... Uh, And so I made her a hope chest for her birthday. And then I had this idea that I would put the ring inside the hope chest and that I would propose to her on her birthday. And so on her birthday, I went over there and I brought this big hope chest with me down into her basement suite and and said, happy birthday. And she hugged me and And she said the moment she hugged me, she knew something was up because she could feel my heart pounding in my chest. (laughs) And sure enough, you know, she loved the hope chest. We still have it. And then uh, she opened the lid and there was a little box in there and came out and I proposed to her and she said yes. And she was ready. I mean, she was really ready. I will never forget. I mean, Shelly's a pretty calm person. You know, those of you that know her, she loves to have fun, but she's relatively even keel. Well, we got in the car because I'd made reservations at this fancy restaurant and so on. We got in the car 
and we were driving to this restaurant, Shelly rolls down the window and she's literally yelling out the window, I'm getting married, I'm getting married as we're driving down the street. She, and she's putting her ring out the window, showing people on the street that we are, she's engaged, we're getting married. She was so ready for that moment. Even though she didn't know when it was going to come, she was ready. And somehow I envision that being the way it is for those of us that are in love with Jesus when he shows up the second time. We don't know when it'll happen. We don't know exactly how it'll happen. But if our hearts are in love with Jesus, we will be yelling out the window, I am going to be with Jesus. And we will be so excited. We will be ready. I'm not sure where you're at with Jesus. Maybe you're deeply in love with Jesus and And talking about this just makes you excited today. But maybe you're in a position where you're going, you know, I'm not sure where my relationship with Jesus is at. If you are in that place and you are feeling something stirring in your heart today and you know who you are and you're going, I want to have that kind of relationship with Jesus. We're going to pray right now and I invite you just to open your heart. You know, it, it's sort of like, you know, you can go through the formalities of engagement and say all the right words, but if your heart isn't in it, it doesn't really mean anything. So I'm not telling you what to say today. I'm just inviting you to open your heart, whatever that looks like for you, and invite Jesus in. And I, I promise you, he would be delighted to connect with you today and start building a relationship with you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the way that you have set this all up. So that you're going to come back again. And it's a surprise how it happens, when it happens, all of that just, we don't really know for sure. And so it boils down to, are we ready? Well, Jesus, we want to be ready. We want to be passionately in love with you. So when that moment happens, there won't be a flicker of hesitation we will just have this resounding yes in our hearts. And so Jesus, I pray that you would come into all of our hearts, especially right now for those that are kind of not sure where they're at with you. I pray that you would fill their hearts with your love. Fill all of our hearts with your love again. And then, Jesus, we pray that you would help us every day to keep stoking those fires of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.